What's up, everybody, and welcome to an off-season special edition of the Falcons Final Whistle podcast recorded right here in the Ticketmaster podcast studios. I'm Scott Bear. That's Tori McElhaney. And what we're hoping to get done over the next 20 minutes is to kind of go over, do a little vibe check with yeah. the Falcons. We've seen lots of OTAs mm -hmm. and mini camps to this point as we head into a darker period where everyone's going to go find a a mountain peak or a white sand beach, right? Um, Amanda, our social, one of our social media managers, told me that a lot of guys are going to Jamaica this year. Wow. Yeah. And you just went last year. I so did. You can give them some recommendations. I, so I went to Tulum first, and then Kyle Pitts went to Tulum on vacation. Oh, so they, honestly, I think they're all just following my lead. Yeah. and Thanks, guys. That's probably a smart thing to do. Um, <laughs> but So what we're going to do right now is talk about what we learned about this Falcons offense. This is an offensive podcast. Yep. What we learned about the Falcons offense during the offseason program and what questions we still have and we still need answers from during training camp. Mm -hmm. And what better time to do that than right smack in the middle <laughs> of the offseason program and training camp. So, Tori, let's just get right into it here and start with things that we learned about this offense. Mm -hmm. And as we were writing this list down, you had this one ready to go in like half a second. Yeah. And I kind of love it. So I'll just let you intro it. Yeah, no, I was just saying before we started recording, I was just like, this offense, I just think is going to be so fun to watch. And I say fun, and I, I know that's probably not a great adjective because a lot of things can fall under that. But I think that in terms of just like the creativity yeah. of being able to, to put it to me like who's quote unquote starting I was having this conversation on the radio the other day like to me it does starters don't matter outside of like the offensive line and Desmond Ritter at the quarterback everything else can be so fluid in terms of who you're putting where how you're putting how you're moving guys who's in motion who's not in motion like you know there are so many different avenues of okay you can put Bajan here you can put Tyler Algier here you can put CP here you can have Drake and Kyle Pitts out wide like there are so many different things that you can do with these guys and I think it just goes along the lines of what Terry and Arthur I think have been trying to build from the get-go I mean they go out and they get Kyle Pitts a, that everybody calls a unicorn because he's such an offensive weapon that's the first person that they drafted in Atlanta in this mm -hmm. new regime at number four overall, highest tight end ever taken in the draft. Then you go the next year, you get a guy like Drake London. Then the next year, you go out and get a guy like Bajon Robinson, who, again, they're using the moniker of an offensive weapon, similarly to how they used Cordero Patterson in 2021. It, it, you know, the way that they were talking about him being a running back on the roster, but an offensive weapon just in general. So to me, when you're talking about all these different pieces that you have accumulated over the last few years, it just excites me about what Arthur Smith can do with this group. Yeah, and you mentioned some of the marquee guys, mm -hmm. but after watching Mac Hollins play in the offseason program, the dude's got it a little bit. Here's the, the thing. He's a big physical he guy. He is. You got Johnu Smith. Scotty Miller is a speed demon. Yeah. Uh, and I'll say this. I think just... Johnu is going to be a sleeper for, yeah. for this team. I think Arthur Smith is re – every time I feel like we talk to Arthur Smith about – just the offense in general, he finds some way to put Janu's name in there. And I think it's because he's really excited to work with a guy like this again. You know, they worked together in Tennessee, and that was the best years of Janu's career. Yeah. I think Janu's excited to come back. We've talked to him on the podcast. I think Arthur Smith is excited for him. We've seen him make some pretty dang good catches through OTAs. So I, I think he's someone to kind of keep an eye out on as well. So when you look at just the depth at skill player mm – -hmm. I think it, it it'll be it will be fascinating to see how they are able to use all of these different pieces. And if you're a defensive coordinator or a game planner, you're like, okay, well, we got to take eight out, and then we got to take seven out, but then oh, we and got then there's five, five, and yeah. then there's twenty five, and <laughs> then there's all these other guys in eighty one that can kind of, which is John Smith's number, that can kind of overwhelm you. Um, and which kind of leads to our th the second thing that yeah. we learned. Yeah. Um, is that Arthur Smith has mentioned positionless football before in years past. Mm -hmm. But I think, and to your point earlier, we're finally getting to see him actually implement right. these ideas that he has because he has the volume and the skilled players required to do it. And what we mean by positionless, look, there's an RB next to Cordero yeah. Patterson's name and Robinson's name. There's a WR next to Drake London. But we're going to see these guys move across the formation. I was talking to Drake London, and I, 
he said, Arthur Smith makes every skill player run every route mm -hmm. because he wants everybody to be able to line up everywhere. Yeah. So you can go in and 22 personnel and go four wide, yeah. right? That, that there are so many different opportunities because of the versatility here that we're finally going to get to see it. Mm -hmm. So I kind of wonder, like there, there have to be the, like these X's and O's dancing in Arthur Smith's head. He's going to hate me saying this, but, and that, that now can go to the dry erase board that can go to the practice field yeah. that can go to to, to game tape, yeah. I think it's going to be fascinating to see what they do with the skill players that they have. 100%. And, and to that point, I know I wrote something, you know, when we were probably in the middle of OTAs where we had talked, I vividly remember this is the first time that we talked to Drake London and Tyler Algier in the same day. And it was one of the very, very first OTAs. And they both really unprompted use the term positionless football which hasn't doesn't happen hasn't hasn't happened before right but arthur smith has been saying it for years since the moment that he got here in 2021 and they go and like what i was alluding to before they go and draft kyle pitts and you're talking about this idea of positionless football and arthur smith always talks about like you know there aren't positions in basketball anymore like kind of mm -hmm. even though there are you know everybody has their their strengths and their weaknesses and where they're supposed to be on the court but there is that fluidity. And I think fluidity and flexibility is the point of all of this. When we're talking about positionless football, we're not meaning that to be like exactly what that means. We're talking about it being such a fluid circumstance where you do have guys like Cordell Patterson and Bijan Robinson and Kyle Pitts who can do a, a bunch of different things. And like what Drake London was saying, running every single route understanding where they're supposed to be on the field when they're asked to get here or there or out wide or inside. It, I mean, it or coming out of the backfield. All of these things, I think, build on top of one, inch, one another. And I think something that, like what I was saying, that I wrote about this whole idea of leaning into positionless football is that this is something that I think Arthur Smith has been dreaming up since he got here maybe even well before that you know let's go back to when he was a coordinator let's go back even farther when he was a position coach I mean this is a guy who I think has been wanting to get to this point for a very long time and you look at the team right now you look at this offense right now and you kind of break everything down and you're like they're there right and I think that the only way that these skill that he can implement these plays and these skill players can do what they do mm. is by having number three on our list of things that we learned during the offseason program. And that's at the offensive line, the the continuity, the talent, that the offensive line production, which was high last year, mm -hmm. I have every confidence, even without them having pads on, to say that they are going to continue in that vein. Yeah. Nobody stays at, at the practice field longer. They have their own shirts about <laughs> speed, right? Yeah. Dwayne Ledford has them like believing and oh, yeah. together. And I, I think that that's the bedrock of everything else that you can do. So when you go into, and they talked about it, they, Arthur Smith and Terry Fontenot talked about it at their postseason press conference, how the offensive line was going to be the foundation of what they were building. Mm -hmm. And they've invested accordingly. Mm -hmm. You've got three eight figure per year guys up front, mm -hmm. a center, and then a left guard who could be a second round draft pick possibly in Matt Bergeron, it could be Matt Hennessy, but nonetheless, they've invested heavily so they can do all the other fun stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think that that can't be forgotten. Right. No, you're exactly right. And something that I'll, that I'll add to that, you're talking about that continuity. And something that I've talked to Dwayne Ledford about, I feel like ad nauseum when I have conversations with him is he's talking about, you know, he's been coaching this position for a long time. And something that he always falls back on is he's like, the longer you can keep a group together, the better they end up being because you use the example of Caleb McGarry and Chris Lindstrom. These are two guys who are drafted in the same exact year. We've had conversations with both of them about this mm -hmm. where they almost can like read each other's minds when they're out there. If some, if a safety moves here, if a linebacker moves here, they know based on that movement exactly where they're supposed to be. And they trust that the guy beside them sees it too and is going to do the same thing. I mean, it's real to talk to them about the connection that they have without saying a word, without doing anything is mm -hmm. I think really, really interesting. And you don't have that if you don't play, if the, the rep, you don't have the reps that they have together. So the longer you keep a solid core five together, I think it's like so important when you're talking about that continuity because you slowly but surely start to, start to feed off of each other and you become one unit 
in a, in a way that not a lot of positions are kind of like. I feel like offensive line is very, very different in that regard where you really are working as one cohesive group of five people, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I, I think the fact that they – you talk about investing heavily. They extended Jake Matthews last year. Mm-hmm. They extend Chris Lindstrom this year. They go out and re-sign Caleb McGarry. Then you also have two guys. You have Drew Dahman, who they drafted here. And then you have Matt Hennessy and Matthew Bergeron kind of battling it out potentially for that left guard spot. It's a it's a very fun group to watch. And I know I've said this before, offensive line play, offensive line talk isn't that mm-hmm. sexy. But when it comes to offensive line, the mundane and the monotonous is what wins the day. And I think that this group, like, has has that yeah. together. They do the boring stuff well. Yeah. And that is clear, even, again, even with, without pad, seeing them work together, seeing how they fit, seeing even how they're working in this kind of passing camp, as Arthur mm-hmm. Smith calls it, it's very clear that they are together. Yeah. And, that, and those are the signs that we need to see. Now, what questions do we have moving forward? The first one is not because we're like, auditioning to be on first take or anything like that it's so when we say that the quarterback is a question mark it doesn't mean we think the quarterbacks around here stink no that's not the case yeah i think desmond ritter has had a good off-season program he's commanded the huddle well people don't like that they want to hear about his arm strength he can get the ball downfield Mm -hmm. almost at times he wants to push it downfield overseeing some other things but that's part of his development and i think that the reason why it's question mark is the guys only started four games right right yeah he's only started four games yeah no they invested heavily in a backup in taylor heineke mm-hmm. who's been to the puppet show and seen the strengths mm-hmm. but he's kind of been, he has a 500 record mm-hmm. so when you look at this quarterback uh, grouping especially with desmond ritter how can it not be a question mark because yeah. there isn't enough evidence of what he can do uh, during the regular season, and he does have to go prove it. He does, and and I think that's exactly what the the Falcons have given him the opportunity to do. I, we mm-hmm. we've been talking for the last ten minutes about all of these weapons offensively in this offensive line that had such a great year together last year, and they're back again this year outside of maybe one. And then you have all of these offensive weapons. I've said this before, and I'll say this again. Desmond Ritter is in what I think to be a really, really good position, opportunity, whatever you want to call it, 100%. for him being as young as what he is. Half the battle, I feel like, with young quarterbacks is putting them in a position for them to succeed. And I think that's why sometimes you see some young quarterbacks struggle is like the infrastructure around them isn't there. And they're, be- they're being asked to do all this stuff and, but they don't have the pass catchers. They don't have the protection that they need. I think Desmond Ritter has the protection. I feel like he has the run game, as we've seen last year. And I also think that he has these weapons. Kyle Pitts is going to get back out there. And I'm really interested to see what happens when he does. We saw what happened when Drake London and Desmond Ritter got together those last four games. Drake London's production went, it went up. Mm-hmm. I want to see that happen with Kyle Pitts as well. Not saying that it will. But I, I, I just think that there, we'll see a difference. And so for me, I feel like the Falcons have done in the off, they've done their offseason work by giving Desmond Ritter something really sound to work with. It's up to him to really just get the ball in the hands of his playmakers. Mm-hmm. And that's something that I think Arthur Smith has talked about. Like he does well. He has like the instinct and the anticipation of knowing where the guys are on the field and being able to get them the ball. He did it at Cincinnati. They see that even now where they don't have the pads on, they're not going 110%. But Arthur Smith talked about that. He talked about the anticipation factor of being a strength of Desmond Ritter. So now the whole thing is, can he go out and do it? And that's the reason why – it's a question mark. Mm-hmm. And I, I think there will be mismatches by de- by play design, yep. by getting your players, like with the versatility and the positionless thing, moving them around to that Desmond has to identify the mismatch mm-hmm. and deliver the ball in a place where that skill player can, even if he throws the ball three yards in the air and it turns into a 20-yard gain, who cares, right? Mm-hmm. It's that can you find those mismatches? Can you identify them with your eyes and execute uh, with proper timing. Um, the second question that I'm really excited for this one. Yeah. I I think it's interesting because when you talk about Cordero Patterson Mm -hmm. and his role and court and CP just talked about this, um, with the first mini camp practice, uh, I believe it was on uh, June 13th Mm -hmm. and 
he was talking about his role and saying that he loved how he was used in 2021. Mm -hmm. And I, I took a look at the snaps and last year he had to be more of a, a traditional running back out of necessity because Damian Williams got hurt and Tyler Algier at the beginning of the season was not the Tyler Algier we saw at the end of the season. Yep. So he kind of didn't have a choice. He, uh, he carried the ball more often um, per game than ever. Mm -hmm. He had 304 I hope I'm getting this right. 304 snaps as a traditional running back mm -hmm. and 46 everywhere else. Yeah. The year before, he had 250 something mm -hmm. as a running back and 142 everywhere else. Yeah. And I think different. that's the ratio that CP wants. Mm -hmm. Is that the ratio that we're going to get? I, I'm yeah. not sure. I, and I think that's the ratio that Arthur Smith wants as well. I mean, in the same vein of we were talking to CP that first day of mini camp, we also brought up. Arthur, talking to Arthur Smith, talking about CP. And he he was the one that was kind of like, he played a different, the two years he's been here, he's played different roles. And even though people can be like, oh, he's a running back, he's a running back, that first year, I mean, even just looking like, exactly like what you said, he was used very differently. And, you know, they were two completely different teams at that time in terms of what they needed from a guy like Cordero Patterson. Now that you have, I mean, let's move it forward. Now that you have, Tyler Algier, who's gone out and proven – well above, I think, proven himself to be a capable three-down back. You know, I, mm -hmm. I think that he really has, and I'm really excited for year two for him. I know a lot of people are a little iffy about it considering they did go out and draft Bijan Robinson, but I, I think they can work really well together. I think there's a compliment that can be had there. Mm -hmm. But you have Tyler Algier, you have Bijan Robinson, and you have Cordero Patterson. And I know I was talking to Michael Petrie, who's the running backs coach – around the same time, around OTAs and minicamp. And he was talking about just like the presence that Cordero Patterson has, not just in the room, but on the field as well. And I think that's something that shouldn't be overlooked. Cordero Patterson, I think three years ago, the name doesn't strike as much fear in offenses as it does today. Yeah, And I think that does make a difference. People saw what he did in 21. They also saw what he did in 22. I mean, his versatility cannot be overlooked, and I, it shouldn't be. So I think the reason why we have him as a question mark isn't that we don't think that Cordero Patterson is going to be productive in this offense. I think that is a fallacy if you think that. But I think it's more along the lines of how does he go w with – Bajan Robinson, Tyler Algier, and in this scheme. And and I think that it is one of those things that he kind of maybe goes back to his roots. I say roots weird because, mm -hmm. like, his roots of 2021. Right. Because I think the, the offense morphs more towards that strength of his being a pass catcher as well. I think there's – I get it a lot in, in the bear mail, mailbag, where everyone sort of says, well, they drafted – Bajan Robinson, who can do it all and move all over the place. So that means that Cordero Patterson will do nothing, no. right? It's, 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 it's not like a replacement. It, yeah. You don't get one and then ditch the this other. This thing isn't mutually exclusive. Right. You, yeah. you find ways to, um, to take advantage of mm -hmm. all of these different opportunities, and you make a linebacker pick his poison sometimes. Yeah. And I think that that's how he's going to be used. And talking to CP – uh, during minicamp is that he really kind of drove home. He's like, if these young guys can take a couple hits off me, like that's fine. Yeah. And then preserve me for later down the season. Just he, he doesn't uh, practice during OTAs. Mm -hmm. He comes out, he came out during mandatory minicamp. And I know again, no pads and we're not going hundred percent. He still got it. Though. He, does, he still got yeah. that extra gear that yeah. you can see. So I think with an, with a mind like Arthur Smith, we'll see he's going to be creative enough to use him. Mm -hmm. I think it will be fascinating at the end of the year to break down those same snap counts and mm -hmm. be like, okay, how did he fit and where did CP want to fit and did those two things marry? Mm -hmm. um, last one, as we're kind of wrapping up our offensive uh, breakdown here, my last kind of question mark was about the wide receiver core. Mm -hmm. And that's one because of a couple things. One, we're pretty sure about the we're pretty sure about a lot of things mm -hmm. on this offense that we weren't last year. But this wide receiver core, outside of Drake London and Kadero Hodge and Frank Darby, mm -hmm. new. Yeah. And there's been a constant uh, cycling of receivers over the last couple of years. So you have a new quarter, and by receiver, we're actually talking about the guys with the W and the R. Right. right? Yeah. <laughs> so we we mentioned Mac Collins, Scotty Miller mm -hmm. is here, Slade Bolden for goodness mm -hmm. sakes, Penny a, Hart, a guy that right. Atlanta people should know well. Yeah. So when you look at this wide receiver core. 
I think it's a question mark because one, how much are those wide receivers going to play when mm-hmm. Pitts and Patterson are moving around? And two, can they give the offense the element that has been missing? When you were talking in 2022, it was the Desmond Ritter and Drake London's getting 30% of all pass attempts <laughs> right, show, yeah. right? Yeah. That's, that's a good and bad thing mm-hmm. because they weren't getting enough from other mm-hmm people. Right. And that's not a slight to Kadero. That's not a slight to Alameda Zacchaeus or um, Russ Gage, even a, a couple years ago, who was playing banged up. I, I just think that we need to know more there. Yeah. Mac Hollins has had one big year. It was last year. Can he do it again? Yeah. Scotty Miller was always like a third or fourth wheel in that Tampa offense, a guy to stretch the field. Yeah. Can he be more and more consistently productive? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. I think something with this group and I, I, it's really interesting because I remember going into this off season and being like wide receiver is a need because at the time when the season ends and Alameda Zacchaeus is, is out of here and you don't know what's going to happen with Kadero Hodge and the only two that you really know are coming back are Drake London and Frank Darby and you have to build up that position in a different way and they go out and get Matt Collins and they go out and get uh, Scotty Miller and I even said going into the draft, I was like, they're going to draft a wide receiver in the second round. I thought so too. I said from the jump that they were going to take a wide receiver in the second or third round. And then they didn't. And then they still didn't go out and get any other receivers when we hit the June 1 day. And and you Mm -hmm. kind of think about some guys maybe falling off of rosters because of cap hits or whatever. And I I, I really do think that for me, and this is not a slight at – Matt Collins it's not a slight at Scotty Miller but to me I don't know 110 percent who's wide receiver number two yeah I don't either I don't think I can sit here right now and we're in the middle of the summer and be able to say I I know who WR2 is you know Drake Lennon's number one and I, I know that you can say like oh well Kyle Pitts because of the role he plays CP because of the role he plays that okay there are variations and that you don't need a wide receiver number two but to me I've been thinking for this entire offseason that they're going to go out and get a wide receiver a a second wide receiver Mm -hmm. who can be that on this roster right now I'm still waiting for that and I think it's something that training camp could really shed some more light on especially when they put the pads on and we do get into joint practices that type of stuff I think is when you see the hierarchy yeah and this offense going back to the very first thing that you and I talked about both before and after we hit the record button is this offense is going to be fun to watch. I'd like to add another adjective. It's going to be fascinating to watch yeah. because there's so many things that they can do. There are some question marks about how some of the players will do and then how it unveils itself. Because Arthur Smith, as we saw last year, he's going to – He's going to show you a bunch of unscouted stuff the first couple of weeks, and then he's going to use that tape against you yeah. down the road. So it's always going to be an evolving thing. And with all these skilled players, with this offensive line as its foundation, I think it'll be really interesting to see how it all plays out. And as we start to learn about these things over the course of July and August and uh, throughout the fall. So that's going to go ahead and wrap it for the offensive review and preview edition of the Falcons Final Whistle podcast. And hey, if you guys have other questions, leave them in the YouTube comments, right? Let's try to generate a dialogue when we're bored and there's no football for another two months and we need something to talk about. Like, what did you learn during the offseason program? What do you still need to know? Drop them in there. Um, Maybe I'll even go in there and answer a couple of them. What the heck? But anyway, thank you guys so much. Please rate, review, subscribe to the Atlanta Falcons Podcast Network. I maybe got that right. Who knows? got it, yeah. It's a miracle. (laughs) And we will talk to you again next time when Tori and I break down the defense. See ya.